Hi, welcome to The Virgo Show. Thanks for joining me again. I'm here with Don Crozier, and we're finishing up a series of um, shows talking about his days in Alaska. Thank you, Don, for inviting me into your home. We were, um, when we finished off last week, we were talking about ice roads, and, or snow roads, you called them. Snow roads, um, I call them but ice roads, but I, I call them snow roads. You called them snow roads, and, and um, in visiting with other people now, I'm finding it funny, there's an actual show out there called Ice Road <laughs> Truckers, yeah. and um, have you seen it? Yes, I have. You have. Okay, what do you have to say about it? <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot, other than you said you built the road, right? I would I would like to see that girl put a set of three-rail chains on one of those trucks. Yeah, you it wouldn't happen, would it? Up. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you made the comment that you're familiar with that road that they're talking about. Very familiar, because you built it. <laughs> you built that road. Yes. Yeah. That's just incredible. We built the road to... from... Uh, Yukon River to Attigan Pass. That was our section of the road. Right. See, when we started that project, we got in a uh, joint venture with a pipeline company. Okay. And they did the pipe work, we did all the dirt work, see. We, uh, they had, we had to build a permanent road for them to get the pipe up there and get the machinery and stuff in there to dig the ditch to build the pipeline. You know? Sure. So that was our first project, was to build a road. But like I said last time, the first project was to build a camp. Right, and then I, I love this whole idea of this, you know, wagon train camp thing that you came upon too. Yeah, well, we left that. We had okay. coffee with them, and then we went on <laughs> up to where I said there was Four Corners for our first temporary camp. It was 35 miles east of Bettles, and uh, we had that little camper. Well, of course, 50 below, the propane wouldn't light that camper. So it's just you and another guy just in a little camper. Guy. Oh my goodness! In this little camper, and uh, I'm glad you left Marie home with the children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, he was from Missouri, and he'd never been in that severe cold before, and he thought we were going to freeze to death. I said, "Well, we've got these good four-star woods bags, best sleeping bags they made." I said. Just crawl in with your parka and everything on. I said, yeah. you'll be fine. Oh, I'll never wake up. I will freeze to death. <laughs> he didn't want to go to sleep. He didn't want to go to oh. sleep. So anyway, we got up the next morning, and then the first thing to do was to set up. The company had hired a trucking company to haul these units up to us. To, they were 40 by 10 trailer units to set up for living quarters. So okay. So we got the first one set up, and, of course, it was... No place to fix anything to eat, you know, and uh, the next yeah, thing we said... what did you eat? Well, oh. they'd, sent us, <laughs> they'd sent us some bologna and sandwiches, but it was froze so hard you couldn't even cut it with an axe. So I, the first thing I said we'd better do after we got the barracks set where we could have a place to live is to get the kitchen unit set up so we get a cook out there. So we did, and then Bud drove over to Bettles where they had a radio phone. You could get a hold of town and told them to send us out a cook, so they flew one out in a little ski plane. He landed in the road there and out jumped the cook. And boy, was I glad to see him. <laughs> <But> you were. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, we uh, got the cook and the temporary barracks set up and got a little crew in, and then we started our permanent camp at Prospect Creek. And we built Prospect Creek and Coalfoot Camp and Dietrich Camp and started in on... Uh, Snowden, or uh, they got another name for it now, but it was Snowden Camp. It was up towards Attigan Pass at the time, which we didn't get finished because in the spring, when we got all ready to go with the camps built and the crews in there ready to start building the road, they shut everything down because they hadn't done their environmental impact statements and oh, all the permits. No. <laughs> so there we sat for four years before they got to go ahead to build the pipeline with all this equipment in there, all these camps. All so these people had, ready to go. Somebody had to take care of them. You couldn't just abandon them, you know. No. So I'd stay there with a cook and a mechanic and maybe sometimes an office guy to keep track of stuff. And it was a kind of a lonely life for a while. I there. bet it was. Well, how did you fill your days? I mean, did you, would you hunt or would you? Well, no, I didn't really hunt. You weren't allowed to have a gun okay. in five miles either side of the right of way. But uh, when the snow road melted, of course, there's no transportation anyway. The only thing in and out is with an airplane. Well, we had built a small airstrip there where we'd get a little two engine plane in, you know, with supplies and, and uh, food and stuff. And. Uh, 
in uh, let's see, 1971, I think it was February 21, we had an official weather station there. Okay. That the government had sponsored, and you had to go out and reset the thermometer every day back to zero. And every third day, we'd call town to tell the airport what the weather was to get hmm. our little plane in, see. Well, I looked one day at the thermometer, and it was 83 below, and I thought, well, there must be something wrong with that oh, thermometer. It had been in the 70s below for a week or more. And I thought, that, that can't be right. So the third day, I called the temperature in, and it was 80.5 below. And they got excited and wanted the thermometer sent in with the plane when it came back immediately, and I did. And that's the record for the United States is 80.5 below. And, and you got to see it firsthand. Yeah. Is there what you it know, done? I think if anybody is out there complaining about our winter this year, and I'm included in this, they need to just come and have a cup of coffee with Don and Marie and talk <laughs> a little bit about that. Yes. Oh, my goodness. It does get cold. There's no doubt about it. So what? Um, we need to finish up this show, Don, but what show did, or, or what um, year did you um, come back, and, and what had been accomplished when you did that? I retired in 1982. 82, okay. Yeah. And so you were up there until then. Yes. And then what did you see finished? Well, we finished the pipeline. You did finish it. You, you oh, were yeah, able that was to completed. be completed by the time and you And I did went that. back to work, uh, normal building roads and paving roads and all that kind of stuff. What year was the pipeline finished? 77. 77. And so then you yeah. worked up there a number of years. Now, did your family come back up there um, after that, you know, or did Marie pretty much stay back here with... Um, well, she, when the kids started high school, we would send them back to our relatives here because they'd miss too much extracurricular right, activities. Right, yeah, and I remember so. them being good in sports. So. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, we, Marie would usually stay until I came home, sure. you know. And then but then once the pipeline started, there was no housing for her, no, so no. she stayed home here She's with the kids. Right. You know. I mean, it doesn't sound like it was fit for much of anything, and so you <laughs> survived quite a bit up there with that. Well, we had big oh. camps, you know. We, it, uh, one of the final camps was Old Man Camp, a 1,400 man camp, you know. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so you can all, kind of relate to when they're talking about what's going on out in the oil fields. Right. The camps yeah, things, I yeah. understand perfectly what's happened out there. Right. We were fortunate where we were because Everything had to come out of the union hall where we worked. So mm -hmm. There was no people standing around looking for work. Right, know. right. But like I always said, I had three crews that worked. One coming, one going, and one leaving. <laughs> Isn't that true? Well, Don, you, I mean, what an experience. But what, what um, you know, when you, when you look back on your years in Alaska, you know, how do you sum it up? You know? Well, it was... An experience, I'll say that much. You know, when we first started, we were 19 years old, and looked like a big adventure, uh -huh. you know, to us. And uh, then after got older and it got into the heavy work, it was a profitable business to right. do, see. Right, yeah. But it took a lot of um, a lot of gumption to stay with it, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah, it did. And so it kind of molds you into the person you are today, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about Because I'm sitting here in your nice, lovely living room as the wind is swirling around outside, and I'm sure that doesn't bother you at all. <laughs> no, the worst I got in, Sherry, I can tell you, we had a pit south of camp we were working out of, and it was frozen, and of course they had to do a lot of drilling and loading powder in to set the explosions off to free it up, break mm -hmm. up the ground. And the fellow went in, we had to go up over a mountain to get back to camp. He went in for a load of dynamite, and when he came back, he said, boy, he said, the wind is blowing over 100 miles an hour down at the airport, and he said, when I come across Finger Mountain, there was a truck in there, and he said, he blew the horn at me when I went by, but I didn't dare stop. He said, I was afraid I couldn't find the road if I ever stopped. And I said, geez, we got to go back and get him out of there. He'll freeze to death. Mm -hmm. I said, his truck evidently quit. So I put all my, I always had a duffel bag with me in the pickup. Mm -hmm. And I put all my winter gear on, face mask, goggles, and the whole works. And we started up in there. Well, as soon as we got up above the brush line into the open, uh, the wind was blowing so bad, you couldn't see the hood of the pickup, you know, the snow. So I got out, went around on the windward side, and got my hand hooked under the, because you couldn't stand up without hanging on to something. It would blow you down. Oh, my goodness. And I could feel the edge of the road with my foot, and we went along there about 
oh, a quarter mile, I suppose, before we finally got to that truck. And the snow had blown so hard, it blew through this door seal around the door, that rubber seal around the uh -huh. car doors, blew through there and filled that cab about half full of snow. Oh, my. <laughs> and that poor guy was sitting there about froze to death. So we got him out, got him in the pickup, and got turned around, and the same thing, I had to lead him back out of there, feeling the edge of the road by foot, because I couldn't even see my feet. And like, when we got home that night on the camp, they said the wind at the airport was 104 miles an hour. So I suppose up on the mountain, it was at least that much. Oh my goodness. Well, thankfully, you made it through that, and like I said, that's winter. That was the worst. <laughs> that was winter up there. So you have a good day in Vergas. I think we'll end with that. Thanks okay. so much, Don. Yep.